Sometimes it's hard to see those blessings, but they're all around us. Last week was a wonderful spring break with great weather. Not so great on the weekend, but it allowed us to, to recognize and count our blessings when we have them. As we work together here today, let us be mindful of the needs and thoughts of everyone else, and that we listen, and that we talk less and learn. And I ask a special prayer for our counterparts to the north in Duval County as I go through a very tough time with the changing of the school names, no matter what their decision. There are angry people on both sides, and we ask that people be calm, and that maybe we learn from one another and how to go forward from this. We ask this all in your name, Jesus. Thank you. Remind me of it. The first time I saw somebody talking back, and I thought, whoa. She's just got a direct connection. Welcome. And the female, too. I'd like to call the board meeting agenda summary workshop to order for today's date is March 23rd, 2020. Welcome, citizens of Clay County. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend today's school board workshop. Those of you who are visitors, few, well, from the district, but you know, we don't see you every workshop, so it's great to have you all here. And as always, if there are any questions, by all means, feel welcome to ask. Let's start, Mr. Broski. All right, good, good morning. I hope everybody's doing well. You may or may not know this, but today's the first day of the fourth marching period. So we're heading towards the towards the home stretch wow. for the 2021 school year. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and review the agenda. Our first recognition is our National Science Foundation 2020 Presidential Award winner in uh, Excellence in Science Teaching, Shakrika Smith from Discovery Oaks for the a presentation recognition there. Do we know when she finds out if she's, I, don't know. I, I mean, one of the top six is very good, you know, that's Pretty. awesome. When is it? He said it'll be a few months before the, few months. A few months before the committee will meet and um, make a decision. That's awesome. So then we'll, uh, we'll also have a presentation because um, April is uh, school media month. So s our very first one is the minutes. If there's any questions there. Okay, number two is proposed supplement uh, allocations for 21 22. Just a couple of quick things. You know, one of the things that I point out to you is you've got a big, huge packet, so I don't expect you to <laughs> you know what's in there, but I'll tell you what's in there. Mm -hmm. uh, the only changes that have occurred since then are remember, we have added one instructional application facilitator to each school which is the technology coach position that we talked about when we had the presentation on synergy for the implementation of that. So that's, that's added to every school. Those schools that already had what was called a technology coach, something a little different, those were taken away. So every school now has one of those relative to help us with the implementation, not only of synergy, but of every application. So that's, that's a difference there. There was a change in CBA, a deletion for FCCLA, but added a department head. It has to do with, it makes sense based on their curriculum, what they do at CBA. And there was uh, an additional uh, football coach at Orange Park Junior, an additional track coach at Wilkinson Junior, because of numbers of students involved in, in those programs. Uh, just as a reminder, one of the things that we tried to focus on, just like with allocations for all other positions, my number one goal is stability. Based on where we are this year, what we've experienced this year, I thought it was best to not make any changes relative to supplements. I would also remind the board that we do on occasion add supplements along the way. So if there is something that's noticed, we'll make those changes uh, as they become more apparent you know, down the road, and so I know that that's a big, huge packet that you're just getting now, but I thought I would save you the drama of trying to figure out no changes other than the instructional, the instructional coach, uh, the instructional application facilitator, which the board approved um, that job description last 
last month. Is That's, that summary in here that you're reading to us? I can send a summary out to you, Thank or you. Give, you, give you a little piece of paper yeah. that has that on there that would be relative to that. Thank you. I'll also say when it comes to all overall supplements, you know, I'm prior to this job I did a, a little bit of time in human resources and we had studied supplements and this was always an area in which uh, Clay County is proud of the fact that we kind of lead surrounding districts in our supplements and what we actually pay our, our folks that do supplement it positions. So it's an area um, of pride for the district. Well, and we know it's important. For sure. It makes our school. So number three then, reappointments of instructional support personnel. Just a quick reminder, this will be a big, huge packet. You know, we have 5,000 employees. So there'll be a packet that will be provided to you prior to that that'll have, gosh, three, 4,000 names on the first go-round. Remember, it's a couple-month process to get us to the point where all employees are reappointed. We start off with our uh, PSC, CC, and uh, AC teachers, as well as our support employees. And then in June, we have our administrators and our probationary annual you know, teachers are then reappointed then. That does not mean that everyone's name will appear in the April board agenda. For example, if a teacher has not uh, done their recertification, hasn't completed the recertification form and applied to the state, they in essence have, similar to being in college, a hold on their account. <laughs> and once they clear their hold, then they come back on the next month. So I know that, uh, especially when I was in in, uh, in HR, you know, I would get panicky phone calls from people. Hey, my name's not there. Hey, my name's not there. Hey, my name's not there. That kind of thing. So remember, it's a four-month process leading us up to next school year um, along the way. So it's one big packet now in April, and then it's embedded within the personnel consent agenda each month from there on forward. So number four is the personnel consent agenda. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that there will be a job description on there for the Director 1 building official. Remember that was the position that was uh, that was described within uh, the meeting that you had with Ms. Ellis related to Ed first. Remember, we had to edit the job description first prior to adding the allocation. So it'll take us a couple months to catch up with that one particular job heading to next year. Okay, number five is the renewal of physicians and medical facilities. You know that our support employees receive a physical. This is the process by which we have approved the providers <coughs> that provide those physicals. I'm proud to say that, um, I don't know what Ms. Troutman did, but, but typically we only get like three companies that are willing to even do this kind of work. So it looks like two, three, four, five, six, seven different companies willing to provide physicals to our Were we able to find employees. anybody in the south end of the county? I'm, I'm thinking Yeah, because we have two. Yeah. That we use Aza Health, which is a, a partnership with our community partnership school, and the other is the Village Doctors. Mm -hmm. So there are two down in the Keystone area. So, and I would thank Aza Health because they are one of our partners for a community partnership school. Maybe they would be willing to. Sure, we can reach out. So I'd we'll, like to. Yes, we we'll we'll reach, reach out, out to them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Aza Health and who is the other one? And Village Doctors. Those are two down there. But Aza Health, I was thinking because it's. It's with our community partnership school. Maybe they would be awesome. Thank willing you. to. And so if we approve this next week, we could always amend it and bring it back. And Thank add you. Some to Thank it. you. So number six, Kelly Services Agreement. This is an agreement that uh, costs nothing, but it improves the efficiency by which we report time. This will prevent the payroll secretaries from having to manually, you know, approve time for individuals that become more automated uh, their whole day. So that's what this particular amendment is. It's I just have one on, on that, and, and it's just because of Kelly Services. Um, I noticed that Alachua County also uses Kelly Services, which uh, I'm sure a lot of districts do. Uh, and I know we've been having a hard time getting substitutes in the Keystone area, so I'm wondering if maybe, and I don't know how this would go about this, but if Kelly Services could say, you know, maybe we could reach out to the Alachua since maybe we'd be able to get some 
people from that area to you to come to the Keystone area because I know we've had some trouble getting to the location and maybe because we're not kind of branching out to that. That's, this is a good, that's a good idea. There is there's a little bit of competitiveness that goes with that industry right. where uh, okay. counties are not as willing to to share their resources sure. with people coming over. We can certainly reach out to Kelly to see if we can and only because they've had a hard time. I mean, I've had a lot of concerns about that too. So, when is our contract up with Kelly Services? When does this run through? Uh, I think it started in eighteen, so I think it's five. So, five year, twenty-three. I would have to look it up. I'm just thinking about Ms. Clark's comment at the last meeting, wanting us to reevaluate. Yeah. So I, I would uh, I did send an email out, and I would invite. Uh, any board member up to, to view that presentation and see that presentation if there's concerns about that, that particular issue. On that same, and don't we have an agreement with Duval, or isn't there something that the Duval substitutes can come into play, County? We got some of their substitutes. They they don't use Kelly. They use another service. That's why. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Right. I knew that there was some input from the Duval area. That's why I was curious. Okay, round number seven, proclamation for uh, Teacher Appreciation Week, May 3rd through 8th, mm -hmm. with Teacher Appreciation Day, day being uh, May 4th. Um, the next item is Administrative Professionals Week, which is um, the week of the 19th of April to the 23rd, with April 21st being Administrative Professionals Day. And then number nine brings us to uh, out-of-state travel. Number ten is the Ingenuity Courseware uh, Agreement. <coughs> this is Ingenuity. Bless you. Ingenuity is the um, courseware that we use for credit recovery in all of our uh, summer programs, nine through twelve, or seven through twelve, I should say. Uh, $99,000 is this contract. It's a pretty good program and has been highly successful. 11 is uh, summer programs, manual and calendar. It's actually very comprehensive. It includes our voluntary pre-K, our third grade summer reading camp for the summer, our sixth grade and junior high, our high school 9 through 12, our, our credit recovery for Algebra 1, our boot camp, ESOL, and ESY extended school year, you can see it's very, very uh, in-depth. I would call the board to page three for a good summary. <laughs> <laughs> page three is a good summary of all of the programs in the summertime. First I do have a question on, on that on the yes, uh, document. First of all, for the second and third grade reading camps, are they going to be offered at Clay Hill and McRae? I didn't see it there, and I'm thinking because um, of where they're located again. Second, third grade reading cramps, Grove Park, Keystone, Charles E. Bennett, Wilkinson Elementary, Doctors Inlet Elementary. Okay, but not at McRae or Clay Hill, and I'm thinking that's those, again, because of their location. It's very difficult for them. I mean, we're talking to Keystone Elementary from that school is about 15 miles. Yeah, I think, I think these are the schools, I think traditionally we've had them at those schools. I think there's been no change to the schools that we've offered them in. Mr. Bassey, do we provide transportation to that? No. Would we be able to add one of those schools? How, how difficult would it be to incorporate? Uh, we can certainly look at adding one of those schools. I mean, I think what we're trying to do is create centers mm -hmm. for all of our programs to, to kind of make it more efficient uh, since funding is really not available right. for summer schools. So this is really... Yeah. Um, but they are very rural areas and, where, and you know, from someone from McRae to go up to one or even, you know, Wilkinson to come into Middleburg even or, it's a, yeah, it's a, a bit of a hike. It's a hike. Uh, the other question I have on the ESE extended school year, I think it's page 26 of the manual, um, talks about the three schools, as, and it says Ridgeview High School, Middleburg High School, and Keystone Elementary, but yet underneath it, it talks about being at Keystone High School. I'm wondering if that's an error up at the top. Should it be Keystone High School rather than Keystone Elementary School? Because see, they talk about the nurse and all the different people they're going to have. Yeah, I'm assuming it is. You should, so I, it, it does say assistance Keystone Juniors, Junior Senior High School. Yeah, see, so I'm wondering junior if junior. that should be a high school rather than an elementary yeah. school. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, That's all I just. Thank you. No problem. Thanks. 
Okay, for number 12, School Library uh, Media Month, a proclamation. For number 13, proclamation on National School Nurses Week. Certainly love our, our nurses. Number 14 is, is something new. It's called mm -hmm. Purple Up Day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what Purple Up Day is... I'm is, starting early. Is, 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 is um, for those students that are military connected, the month of the military child. In Florida, it's being celebrated on April 21st, uh, although it's recognized as April 15th in, in other areas. So what I didn't realize about Purple Up Day, because I was trying to figure out why, why purple, purple up, and all that, but if you, I'm being told this is true mm -hmm. now, if you mixed Air Force Blue with Army Green, with Navy Blue, with <laughs> Green Red, and Coast Guard Blue all together, it would equal purple. There you go. So that's how we came up with purple. I thought it was red purple. and blue were purple, but... <laughs> and allegedly, if you mix them all together, it's purple, and thus, purple up there. Several of us are on, on board. There we go. That's right. You get the purple Today day is a purple day. Yeah. If you don't have purple, red, white, and blue is always a good option. There you go. There you <laughs> go. Got it all covered. <laughs> and when is the National School Nurses Week? What is the dates of that? I don't see the same it. week as the National uh, School, School Nurses, Nurses Week. Right at the Usually I don't the same week that. as the Teacher of the or Teacher Week. Six through twelfth of, of May. May. Yeah, of May. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the same week as Teacher Week? Okay, good. All right, thanks. So then we're up to fifteen, which is allocation changes yeah. for twenty. 21, and then 16 is allocation changes for 21, 22. There's nothing added at this point. And then 17 is our monthly financial reports. Eighteen is budget amendments. Nineteen is the famous deletion of certain items report. Mm -hmm. Twenty is a renewal of architectural services. You can see the four um, architects listed at halfway or three quarters of the way down on the page. Twenty-one is the uh, bid renewal for the ramp stairs uh, system, as well as flooring services, and they were awarded to GA Manufacturing out of Keystone and Teal Tile Carpet. 22 is um, preliminary final uh, plans for Lakeside Junior High School restroom renovations. <coughs> Placeholder there. 23 is the uh, elementary school R architect contract. Okay, they're recommending using the same one in the effort to save money for architectural. It will be the same cost. design as Discovery Oaks. Same mm -hmm. design as Discovery Oaks. And when do we expect to start building? We we'll start the process uh, next year. Mm -hmm. Okay, with an opening in 23. So we'd start like August. What when of next year? Uh, yeah, August. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question in the world. I sure. don't see Bryce here, so maybe some Bryce. Um, that um. Uh, when she she was going to get an architect to look over the Keystone area, and I wanted to, and it's, I was going to include. I haven't heard anything back from that. So do we know? So it's, we have my, that? it's my understanding that they're doing a feasibility study for that mm -hmm. piece of land. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's in the works already. Okay. But I can double check. That's what they were going to include, Tina, in on the. Well, they actually the, come out and look at that's what we talked about. Um, feasibility study. Right. So they they haven't come out physically to look at anything. Not to my knowledge. That you would be there for the feasibility study? Well, As just that I would be, you know, be included That's what we in said project. here at our board meeting when we talked about it mm -hmm. to include Tina in that when they come out and look at the property, she is right. concerned about it. And oh, I was unaware that you would be there. I, I was, I understood it as after the fact no, that they would do, like they would look at the when you got the architectural know-how. Mm -hmm. You know, it was more, as I recall, we were talking about the St. John's River management rules and, uh, and 
water retention. I mean, there were all sorts of different phases of that. And that's why I'd like to be there so they can yeah. explain that to me. Yeah. Well, I hope they'll explain it to all of us. <laughs> yeah. So 24 then, it's Middlebrook High School restroom renovation. 25 is pre-qualification of contractors. That concludes the uh, consent agenda on the discussion agenda. Can we, can we go back to the feasibility study? You'll follow up with yeah, Frank follow, and I'll find out why Tina has you know. included. Yeah. Or if I they mean, haven't, maybe they haven't physically been out yet. Maybe that's yeah. not but, but it was important to her to be there when they go out to the property. And we talked about it here, so <coughs> that needs to follow I'll talk through. to Bryce. She's, she's in a training this morning, so I'll All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Okay, Human Resource Special Action A. There is special action, so if you have um, any questions, please please give me a call. So then that takes us to the public hearing to approve the adoption of the English Language Arts uh, material. As you know, this is um, a year for adoption of English Language Arts. Uh, this process began many months ago with teacher representatives from each school who then reviewed and vetted using the, uh, the state instrument for reviewing these, uh, these materials. And really the district was looking for materials that were K-12 articulation aligned for ones that were aligned with the best standards which are now currently being implemented and ones that had insulary materials that had good online support uh, for those materials. So many, many people over many months have gotten us to this point where we are now and those products are listed on page three, which are by Sabbath Learning. Okay, and then the last item, D4, is the Athletic Field Maintenance uh, RFP. To be honest, I'm not really sure uh, where to go with this one. We started this item back December 1st. We had a board workshop related to this particular item. We had, a, we had it brought up at the December 10th uh, regular school board meeting. Uh, questions were then raised by board members related to this item. We then brought it back to a board workshop on December 15th. On January 7th, we, we had the, uh, the board chair open for a motion. Ms. Clark made a motion to approve. There was no second, so the motion stopped there. So the item stopped there. We then had the coordinator of uh, district athletics go out and meet with every board member relative to this RFP and awarding on this RFP. Uh, since then, there's been no questions, no comments related to this issue. I just kind of bring three things to the board's attention related to this. This has been you know, three, almost four months now that we've been working on this particular one item to be approved. I remind the board that Florida Department of Education Rule 6A 2.0010, which states that all educational facilities uh, and ancillary facilities constructed by the school board uh, will comply with the state requirements for educational facilities, which within that, Chapter 5 says that uh, athletic fields were provided shall be maintained in a safe and acceptable condition for their intended functions. Okay. So I would also point out to the board, not only do we have an obligation to maintain these fields, but you also have to have a category three ornamental license issued by the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. There's only one person that works for the entire Clay County School Board that has such a license. Okay, so this is a service that needs to be provided in order to provide athletic fields for our students, we have no one in-house that can do that particular job. The state has state rules saying that we must do this job, in essence. When I inquired about RFPs, because I've been around a long time, 31 years, and I asked, basically, does anyone know the time where an RFP bid was not approved by the school board? And the answer I received was no. So I'm not really sure where else to go with this item. We've attempted to make modifications based on concerns. We went from a three-year contract to a one-year contract. I know this, uh, and maybe we'll have pictures sent 
we have an obligation to maintain our facilities. The amount of money that's paid out of district funds, $42,000, is, is really a pittance in comparison to what other districts spend on field maintenance. So this really should not be an issue. I'm not sure why it's an issue. But I will say that uh, I just want our grounds taken care of for our students. It's really just that simple in my book. Uh, I'm not sure if I left anything out, so I'm going to refer to Mr. Scramolo. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, no, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, I think the big thing for the board to remember with this agenda item is it's a lot bigger than just athletics. You know, I like to consider it a multi-purpose facility. These facilities hold graduations, ROTC competitions, band competitions. Anyone that rents our facilities uses these facilities as well. Um, you know, and uh, if any board member would like to visit a site, I, I'd be more than happy to go out there with you and, and show you what our needs are. So, okay. any questions? What do we need to do to get it back on on the table? It's it's on the table now. So what do we need? And so it'll be brought forward at this particular at this board meeting. And I'm hoping for the for the board to consider this. You know, for me, I consider myself to be a very simple, practical man. The grass needs to be taken care of. Forty-two thousand dollars in comparison to what other districts spend on this issue is a very minimal mm -hmm. cost involved. Do, and, can I ask how much do other districts spend? Uh, up to four hundred thousand, I think, was Lake County's. Four hundred thousand. Of course. And so most of course those more. We're comparing it to the same size county. Lake is approximately the same size. Right. It's a tad bigger. Mr. Bronzi, I'll also just add that, you know, it, it, it is the expectation of our parents and our community. I, I have had some coaches and parents reach out and, you know, want to know where this is headed. They are concerned. It's it's tough being where we are in Clay County, you know, to our, I guess, depending on how you look at that, to our right in Bradford. They have a, you know, full $250,000 turf complex, which is a little exorbitant in my, in my opinion. What high school? At Bradford, yes, ma'am. And, and then at, in St. John's, you know, it's it's also it's also very nice as well. So it's just the the expectations of our community is that you know we do have have decent facilities. Um, so the additional expense, because obviously it costs more than forty two thousand dollars to maintain these fields. Yes, ma'am. Is internal funds. Yes, ma'am. How are the internal funds generated? So athletic directors from ticket sales, so parents coming to games, and then also any kind of sponsorships or partnerships that the athletic directors make. And we've had, I mean, I know in our conversation we were talking about sponsorships from, like, uh, I was trying to think of the soccer net situation. I mean, we have people who are willing to sponsor our teams and put money forward, but also help with equipment and that sort of thing. For sure, for sure, yeah, athletic director, and that's one of the things in my position I try to do is help train our athletic directors on how to create more revenue streams for their student athletes, that's, that's big. And so this is done by the athletic director already. So to anticipate the athletic director to be out there cutting the grass. Well, this is a lot more than just grass cutting, but yes, ma'am. Which, it, and it includes bug killing, it includes getting the sand spurs out. Correct. I mean, Fire I can't imagine yeah. fly, you know, falling or whatever. And the soccer player sliding to kick a ball and running into a, a patch of sand spurs. That would just be delightful. You know, well, those are separate licenses, too. You got an ornamental pest control license to spray for like mole crickets, which tear up the field, you create mm -hmm. issues with the field, fire ants, and those things. And then there's a separate like, pesticide license to deal with the, uh, the weeds and those things that inevitably come when you, when you have grass in Florida. And is, is it different grass on the football fields? Is it different? It's a Bermuda grass. Yeah, it's like a golf course type of grass. Because I, I was at Oakley for the pass and review, and that was held on the football field. And of course, I'm sitting there thinking about this RFP and going, whoa, look at this grass. You know, I mean, it's really, it's special. We have, really we have mean, some surfaces that, that are not serviced by that. Mm -hmm. and they're, they're not playable, nor are they safe to, to you know, uh, twist ankles, tear ACLs, those types of things are the inevitable. And how many students do we have in our athletic programs approximately? Just under 6,000. 6,000, yeah. But then we have yeah. to add band. Band. Right, right, right. 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 Oh, yeah. Maybe Orange Park Junior, we continue to get emails because yeah. of the standing water. Yeah. Like sand, sand We're working on that drainage. 
Mm-hmm. We're working on that drainage. Mm-hmm. Awesome. <laughs> it's a never-ending battle mm-hmm. in that area. That's, that's it for the agenda, Madam Chair. Any questions? Any other questions or comments? Before we move on to our next agenda item, Mr. Bickner, do you have anything to add that we're going to need to know for anything? I didn't see anything, just making sure. Um, there's nothing on there that, that's probably the biggest two items or the two on the discussion agenda that have been spoken of. I don't know that there will be parents that come in to talk about the English program. There probably will be. Um, as to the RFP, I think Mr. Broski and Mr. Scrimmel will cover it entirely. So. Okay. And the, that is a discussion item for the English language. If we have a lot of parents that come in, I, I mean, as the chair, you can change the discussion item like before the superintendent's presentation. So if there are a lot of people there. It's a public hearing, so they would speak at the time of the item. At the time, well, true, but if we don't, these are discussion items. These you are could not bring it up to the board at the beginning of the meeting, asking the board, do we all agree to move that public hearing up to the beginning of the meeting? And if so we all agree, right. then we could do that. Okay. That's how so you would handle sure. it. And I think it's important that um, when we take this item up as a board, part of our discussion and explanation to the community needs to be the expectation that whatever curriculum we're using, whatever curriculum maps we have in this county are going to be aligned to the Florida standards. Mm-hmm. That we're not incorporating political agendas, that this is not um, an opportunity to indoctrinate children, that this is much like what the governor recently released. We're committed to quality education mm-hmm. in the state of Florida and we're going to teach according to the standards. And having spoken with folks in the English language area, because I had concerns. I mean, having taught, making meeting without books, <laughs> whatever, making certain that there were there were resources available to the students, resources available to the families. I felt very strongly about, very good about the process that we've gone through in encouraging and using our teachers. <coughs> and then within that, also, did we have we had an open? I know when we had our last adoption, and I want to say it was math or science. We had the room off to the side open so that people could come in and look at the materials. And are we going to be doing that as well, or has that been available to families? <coughs> yes, ma'am. We're going to have that in one of the labs from mm-hmm. 5 till 6 beforehand. Great. We, uh, which it was part of the paper to po- um, put in the clay today. That was part of Good. the advertisement. Good. So that that's been advertised, that they have the opportunity to come in, yes, put their are. hands on the on the materials. Yes, I mean that's that's critical to yes, a lot ma'am. of parents as well. There, it's also so in their. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, it's also in the advertisement that we have materials in our department, which if anyone would like to look at those even today, uh, we have those over in our office, and uh, they are able to make an appointment through Miss Onora and uh, to review the material. Great. And is that Thank posted you. on our website? It's also posted on the website. Links to these uh, student materials are also on the website. Mm-hmm. But is it clearly on the website that parents may view the material? Is that, you know, they open up our, our website and they can see, parents, if you'd like to view, click here. If they, they go to our instructional, if they go to the instructional resources page, they'll see it. I'm not sure about the, the main page. Yeah. We, we might want to add that to make it link more that simple. to the agenda so that there's a hyperlink. If parents are on our agenda, they can be taken immediately to. Yeah, we can do that. Mm-hmm. That just makes That's it a good idea. and accessible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it, it also might be helpful if we had a hyperlink to the Florida standard so that parents understand while our resources are important that we're using, what drives education is the standards themselves. So these are just like what we said, they're resources, they're not a... Mm-hmm. I know that there are some, I mean, if you go into language arts, let's say, um, mm-hmm. you should have a hyperlink to the Florida, the best standards. Okay. So, I'm just I say should, because I used to be able to get there, so... But for, for us who, who live in the education world, mm-hmm. we know where it's to go to find those yes, things. Yes. But if we can make it readily accessible on the agenda for right. parents, I think that would ease a lot of these concerns about what are they sneaking in, what's happening in the classroom, what are they not telling me, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Absolutely. So if it's just there and 
easily accessible. I think it'll be some years. Is this? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say on the actual um, link in the agenda for the board, there is a link to the page that lists every item, and there's a hyperlink to the uh, resources. Okay. Great. Right. Right. This I. Do, I'm, I feel like I'm in a little cocoon. Does the entire state of Florida go through an uh, adoption at this point? The state of Florida has, um, this is the English language arts year for, for adoption, and then next year's math. So they predict, or, or they tell us what we're to do. So, exactly. So if families are like, well, they're not doing it in St. John's County, or they're not doing it in, well, yes, they are. And, and that would be that district's choice. going on throughout the state, and it's covering all the counties. Well, you yeah, said a, a county can choose to postpone an adoption. So right, right. Other right. counties yeah. will be doing that, but we're following the schedule. We're following the schedule. Right. And I can to do. tell you that St. John's is following the schedule as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they Usually the first one we look at. <laughs> Very good. Do you, and shall we move on to the um, yeah. next workshop? The next, the next item is on cell phones, so I thought I would, I would help the board out with um, this discussion so the board would have a starting point to have a discussion. I passed out two pieces of paper to you today, and then we passed a folder out to you last time that we met. The two pieces of paper that you were given today was a summary of all the pieces of paper that we gave you last time, which is, if you take a look at it, we tried to, um, to nail down the major points of each one of those counties policies. So you can see in clay we have what our policy is or what our student code of conduct says. And then for Sarasota, Leon, Collier, etc., we tried to just grab the, the one sentence, <coughs> the, get it down to a very small amount of, of, of information. That's front and back on that piece of paper. It's kind of just to show you what other people are doing. Then we also surveyed our, our administrators um, in the district. I think it's important to recognize that anything in the code of conduct or in you know board policy has to be implemented, uh, and the ability to implement it uh, and the people involved in the implementation are important to consider their thoughts in the process. The second piece of paper that I gave you was essentially what's in our policy where it says bring your own device what puts in the code of conduct related to cell phones and then through the survey process and consultation with a group of folks here are some things that we thought language items that we thought the board ought to consider that wouldn't handicap people at the school level but also provide some more clarity to our policy related to cell phones so when we surveyed um, administrators, it's kind of interesting to me how there's a difference between elementary, junior high, and high school. In elementary, when we looked at it, and we, we asked our principals at the school level um, how they handled cell phones, et cetera, basically universally uh, powered off during the instructional day. I mean, we're talking 25 to 25. Like, not even one person said anything different. So I feel really comfortable recommending that uh, to the board when it comes to our elementary schools. We thought additional language to include things like it's a privilege to have electronic device at school prop, you know, on school property. It's not a, it's not, you don't have a right to have this. It's a privilege. And then the second part would be the language that would be something along the lines of. Uh, students may use the electronic devices during instructional time for educational purposes when it's sanctioned by the classroom teachers. There are times where a teacher wants the student to use the cell phone, and we don't want it to be against either board policy or, in this case, the code of student conduct, and we wanted to make sure that people expressly knew that if the teacher gives permission, that you can use it. Okay, because sometimes they do use it for educational uh, purposes. And then it says, otherwise, the electronic device must be powered off and out of sight during the instructional day. So I feel really good about elementary. That's essentially what we're doing now, according to everyone that's out there. We feel like that's reasonable, rational, etc. When you start to move into secondary, it becomes a little bit more complicated um, because of the age of the learner. In junior high, when we asked um, 
secondary administrators. Out of the junior high, seven responded, hey, totally off. So similar to elementary school. Okay. Some, you know, 13 said they had some sort of workable policy related to when they could and couldn't. Seven said they want it totally off during the school day. So you'll notice that the language suggestion there is it's a privilege, that statement. Students may use the electronic device when instructed to by the teacher. Okay, similar to the elementary language. Student may not use the electronic. We thought it was important to kind of add these caveats to it for obvious reasons when you hear the language. Students may not use the electronic device in any area considered a personal space, which would include the restroom and the locker room. Because, as you know, that could lead to all kinds of things that we don't even want to talk about here, you know, relative to student behavior in there. So we thought kind of putting that in there was a good point to put in. And then the last item says students may not use electronic devices to accept or make phone calls or video conferencing during school hours unless instructed to do so by administration. Okay, so we're, and we think those are all pretty rational from the people that are actually implementing the policy related to that. Now, in full transparency, the issue becomes the issue of the hallway versus the lunchroom, okay, and whether you allow them to or not. And so when we were considering what to do for this board workshop to help the board in their discussion, one of the things that I would kind of bring to the board's attention is that I deliberately left those off of the sheet because it's my belief that the people that are implementing it at the school level should be the people that should have great say within that, within that realm, okay. You listened to Mr. Daly last time we met or two meetings ago, whenever it was, speaking about his experience as Middleburg High School's principal and how discipline went down when he allowed it to occur in the cafeteria because now students then have an opportunity to do that. We realize that parents sometimes want to contact their students too. And so all of those things are factors that are in there. So my recommendation or my belief is that, and it's just, you know, for the board to weigh in on obviously, but is that the people at the school level that are actually implementing it should have great say in how it's implemented. You know, some people believe that it should be more stringent and some people take the view that the world has changed dramatically since the days that we were all in school, okay. And so how to implement something that's fair on this particular topic is very challenging. This is a more challenging topic than one might think. Well, this is great information you gave us. And my only concern about what you're saying, and I don't think we should do anything that's going to interfere with the discipline of the administration. And I agree that, you know, allowing it to be used maybe in the hallway and cafeteria is fine. But I think we need to have consistency because we will get calls that will say, well, you know, at Ridgeview they can use their phone in the cafeteria and Orange Park they can't and that's not fair. So I think we just need to be consistent with all our high schools and our junior high and our elementary. That would be my one concern. Yeah, and I have the same thought process that you have. But then I also took a step back and said, this is what we're currently doing, right? So we haven't gotten any of these concerns yet. And so maybe letting, whatever the saying is, sleeping dogs lie is the better course. Did you want this new page to change what we've got, Ms. O'Connor? Yeah, I would like to add those. Add to it. Add to it, yeah. Because I just believe that those are common sense things. Hey, you shouldn't be videotaping in certain private areas, restrooms, locker rooms, et cetera, that it's a privilege. It's not a right to have a cell phone or electronic. You can, in fact, use it when instructed to by the teacher. It seems like common sense to me. 
And so nothing that, that we're looking to add to the policy, the suggestions, appears to be um, a problem yeah. in, in my view. Yeah. And then I was just transparent about the leaving off of the specifics of the hallway versus the cafeteria versus the parking lot versus the, mm -hmm. the and, and I can appreciate the consistency um, uh, you yeah. know, comment, but I can also... change it and if we see that there's a lot of feedback, we can always readdress it if we had to, but can I, can I ask one more question? Sure. Mr. Bigner, how does all of this fall in line with the school board policy on cell phone use? The current school board policy? The current school board policy is terrible. Um, <laughs> Bonnie actually dug it up for me. <laughs> Who wrote that policy? <laughs> Pardon me? Who wrote that policy? <laughs> well, it was written in 1991. Oh. <laughs> School words were new. When, when cell phones were this big, yeah, right? <laughs> and they, uh, they fit in the back. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were super. I think that they're saying. Yes, sir. We were being very forward thinking at that time. And I think so. we're going to need a policy for these new contraptions. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, they did it because they were worried about drug sales on campus. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the new cell phones were great for drug sales. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I have others if anybody else would like them, like the police. Or, um, you were ready for that question. And what that current policy says under drug abuse and weapons policy, it says that individual school administration will establish a public guidelines for authorized possession of pagers and cellular phones during extracurricular activities. I don't know that anybody is, with a pager. That is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, we still have in our board policy, or, or what you're proposing, we still have, in, in what's already in code of conduct, Language about pagers, pagers although I don't know anyone that has one. Beth has one. I'm thinking of going to buy one just because it's out of my guard. Um, so the only other thing that I would point out, and I'm, I think it's it's kind of mandatory, is after the Parkland shooting, the legislature revamped 1006.07 and put in there that a student may possess a wireless communication device while the student is on school property or in attendance at a school function. And so they've kind of taken away the consent aspect of it. The legislature has acted and said, students may do this, because I think the big issue with Parkland was people needed to have a way to call their parents and let them know they weren't dead. Mm -hmm. And so they did that, and they also put in the very first sentence, and you can see I've highlighted the second sentence about the May, but that very first sentence, they want, it says, each code shall include, but is not limited to, notice that a wireless communication device includes the possibility of the imposition of disciplinary action by the school or criminal penalties if the device is used in a criminal act. So what I think that you have here in, in the thoughts that have been put together by uh, Ms. Fogarty and, and Mr. Roski is good. I think it needs to be expanded to include those two things from 1006 or 7. One is that while you say it's a privilege, I think the legislature said you may have one. And that's kind of, they have spoken. Two thirds of the policies that I've seen around the state is after we got these, I went back and looked. A lot of them use the verbatim language out of this statute that says a student may possess a wireless communication device on school campus or extracurricular activities. And I think that they did that because no one wants to argue that point. When somebody comes in and says, it's a right and we can take away that right, well, the legislature said, you may do it. And so we, we can regulate it. So if we omitted the, the first bulleted point on the piece of paper and added F, well, is, they're possessing a cell phone even when it's in their backpack. Didn't we set up the rules as to when it can be out and actually be well, you can turned still on and used? You can regulate it. That's what I just right. said. Yeah. They may have it, but you can regulate it. And if somebody won't, won't cooperate, you can take it out of their hand, turn it off, and shove it in their backpack. Right, we can't take it from them. But I don't believe that you can take you it physically take it from, from them right. and, and not let them have it back. 
Now, I haven't seen any case law on this because it's new and nobody's argued the point. Right. But that's what we're stuck with is what the legislature did for all of their many patchworks after the Parkland shootings. See, that's, that's a bummer because I really liked, there was, I have to find which one in here, but in the packet of samples that you guys gave us, there was one where they spelled out the consequences for mm -hmm. inappropriate use that of the That was Collier phone. County. Was it Collier County? Collier yeah. County. And they I thought spell it was that excellent, can be an excellent way to, to, but if you're saying it's a right and not a privilege, I could see where that yeah. could be a controlled. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't know how else to read what the legislature right. said. No, they say you right. may do it, yeah. and they su supersede whatever choices we make. But they also said in the very next breath, each school board shall adopt rules governing the use of wireless communications devices right. by a student while on school right. property or in attendance at a school function. <coughs> and so you can make the rules, you can shut them down, you just can't take it away. Right. So, which that would be fine. I mean, if well, you, let me let you me ask if I may. Let's say point. I'm in a fifth grade classroom, which is what the policy and the procedure is right now. Right. And the phone goes off, and everybody goes, "Ooh, Terry has oh. her phone on." So I say, "Terry," and this is the cur the current practice would be, "Terry, I need to see your phone, and I'm taking it to the assistant principal. You need to go to the assistant principal." to pick up your phone at the end of the school day. I, I have no problem with that. They're okay. allowed to so possess that's it, but you can't it. abuse it. And the, and the reason and that... that's a disciplinary matter if you do abuse it. Right. And the reason that you do that is that if it continues to be, you know, Terry keeps letting her phone on, right. Terry, we've talked to you about this numerous times, then it has to go, then the parent is called by the assistant principal or the principal, and, you know, there's a problem, Terry can't, you know, can't, doesn't know how to turn off her phone. Well, that I, I happens gonna, as well. Yeah. I was going to say, if you're like me, you know, I just, I've always had a stupid phone, a flip phone up until about six months ago. Mm -hmm. I figured I had to turn it off, but the phone I've got in my pocket, since they don't service my flip phone anymore, I'm not sure how to turn it off. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, it, and just even even when you turn it, I mean, we've all been sitting here with smashing the phone it now, even if you it. turn it off the oh. ringer, you still get the buzz, and particularly if it's sitting on, you know, you can <laughs> Whatever, so as it's buzzing across the table. I got mad at one and threw it in the Black Creek. It, yeah, it's stuff ringing. I stop guess ringing. Yeah. My question is um, if we have it in our policy, like the Collier County, where there are certain levels of degree of infractions and the punishment ultimately being removal of your phone, can we do that based on statute? As a disciplinary action, can we go mm -hmm. ahead and say, you can pick your phone up at the end of the day, it will be in the principal's office, or sure. are we required to allow them to hold on to it at all times? Mr. Frost, so, so if I could, you know, if you, this would be my thought, but you're the attorney. If you have it codified in, in board policy, then there's no wiggle room right. at all. And that, that, that'd be a problem to actually implement something at, at the school level. So I would, uh, my thought here was, if you recall, I think there was commentary made that we're talking about direction for the code of student conduct because that is a board approved document. And in my view, the, the policy that the board develops, whenever you address that again, should be more broad to allow for the flexibility to actually be implemented. Um, you know, over time. So I would, I would just kind of remind people that the whole purpose of this was we're going to start kicking off the uh, code of student conduct revisions to get ready for next school year. The issue of cell phones was brought up. Mm -hmm. We're simply trying to get direction from the broader is better because you know if the whole problem with Louisiana law is they tried to codify every single thing there is, okay. and so whenever you fall in a crack, and we fall in a crack on something else this week. You always have problems because then you have to figure out where to go with it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that he's right. I think it needs to be flexible enough that yeah. that the principals can mm -hmm. do what they need to do to run their school. Because I can tell you my belief is that running Middleburg High School is a whole lot different than running Fleming Allen High School. Mm -hmm. And I don't base that on anything other than the phone calls I get. And so I think they need that ability to do that. But ultimately, we're going to have to do something because it says in 100607 that we have to have a code of conduct, but it also says we have to have board policy. And when you adopt a code of conduct, it becomes part of board policy, but it's not the be all and end all of board right. policy. Could we, you have to have something more. Could we possibly put in our policy um, 
that uh, cell phone use, student cell phone use would be regulated in accordance with the student code of conduct. Would that be sufficient? Is that even necessary if we were to just go with something like this and keep it very broad? I'd have to think about the language that you would use there. What you can't have is you can't have something in policy and refer to another document that changes year to year and say something like as amended or as legislated or as changed. And so you have to be careful with the language about that because it will fail. So there were a couple of things that I thought we should consider when I looked through this packet with other school districts and what they do. One thing in particular, I'm going to take this off for a second. Which county are you looking at, Ashley? So first we can look at Oregon City County, or City School. In the middle of that paragraph it says, students are required to use the Oregon public filtered internet access at all times with all electronic devices. Use of personal internet connections are prohibited. And I think, to me, what appeals to that is our Wi-Fi, I would assume, has guardrails on it where if they're using their own data plans, they could access Facebook, they can access Instagram, they can access YouTube. But in a classroom setting, I was talking to an elementary teacher about this, they have the ability, if it's connected to our Wi-Fi, to go in and shut off certain websites that even aren't blocked necessarily by our Wi-Fi guardrails, but the teacher can go in and say, no, you're on YouTube, you don't need to be on YouTube right now, and shut it off in the classroom. So for that purpose, I really think that that would be a smart way for us to protect the kids from getting into situations that they shouldn't be getting into, and I'm thinking of situations we've had in the very recent past, that that's just another way to kind of put a stopgap, that if you're in the classroom, you better be, you know, and the expectation is that teachers are going to monitor it. When we say that they're being used for educational purposes only in the classroom and with express permission from a teacher, then my expectation is the teacher is going to be paying attention to what the students are doing on the devices. And from that one teacher's explanation, it sounds like it's kind of like a dashboard where they can see what the students are doing as long as they're connected. And if they're on the proper program and they're working on something, yes, they do see exactly who's on it. So to me, that's an appropriate use for a cell phone in a classroom. And I liked that language as far as giving some more specific expectations about when we're using cell phones in the classroom, we're not playing games, we're not on social media, you know. That's in the classroom, but then what happens when they go into the hallway or when they go into the cafeteria? And they're communicating with friends or whatever. The rule still applies. Now, obviously, there's more opportunity to get away with breaking the rule at that point. And I mean, trying to... But if they get caught... I can't imagine trying to go into a cafeteria like Ms. Pickett was talking about and regulating, okay, what website are you on? Where are you? Where are you? What again? Are you, you know? Right. My understanding is many phones have their own hotspot. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just think, you know, because what I've heard from community concern is, well, how do they even have access to social media while they're at school? They've got their phones, yeah, period. So I just think it's something to consider. And even if you only put that clause when we're talking about... Where's the language that was recommended? So students may use their electronic devices during instructional time for educational purposes when it's sanctioned by the classroom teacher. And then on that bullet point, you can put that that's... So in the classroom, we're all on school Wi-Fi. We're not using data. I think that's going to be very hard to enforce for our teachers and administrators. And I understand what you're saying. And I understand that that is a better way to monitor what's going on. But they're 16, 17-year-old kids. We're not going to be able to... I mean, somebody give me an example who's been in the classroom. Can you monitor something like that? Well, I didn't. Yeah. No. It's going to be very difficult. They can have open several different windows in their phone. Yeah. Back and forth. There's so many. Yeah. The most effective monitoring is whether they have it out or not. Yeah. And then you have to look at their screen to see if the Wi-Fi symbol on or the LTE symbol on. Right. But think about it. You're in the front of the class and you're teaching. Tedious thing. I alluded to this last 
last time is that if, if the focus is, is going to be instruction for three or four administrators and there's 1,500 kids or 2,000 kids or 2,700 kids, that what, do you, what are you going to enforce? Because you can't enforce everything. There's just no. No, otherwise you're a full-time policeman and you're mm -hmm. no longer an educator because there's, 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 well, are they wearing hats or not wearing hats? Is, is the dress too short or is it not too short? Are they got their cell phone out or they not have their cell phone? Exactly. Are they swearing in the hall? So you have to attack one thing and sort of envelop all of your resources around that one thing and tamp it down, and then it's whack-a-mole. <laughs> the other thing comes up, and you've got to go hit that thing. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you try to tackle everything at once, you know, tardies, all the things you want to address, um, you absolutely end up doing nothing because the resources are just too limited. And that's the practical reality of running a public school, and it is what it is. And I think if you're if you're pragmatic about it, you can attack something, saturate it with the available resources, and, and you can get it into a manageable place. But as I said last time, and I've given this a lot of thought since, you know, I gave it a lot of thought as an assistant principal uh, when I was in a transition at, at Fleming Island High School, and then again as the principal, is ideally they wouldn't exist, but they do. And we didn't grow up with them, so we don't have etiquette and protocols in the place. So we talked as a school community about what, what were our expectations, what do we think would work and be fair and manageable. And then the, the, the teachers, the student leaders, the, the administrative team <coughs> together, we came together and said, well, we think we can do it this way. And then we taught those things at the beginning of the year in our teach twos so that everyone in the whole campus was on the same page about our expectations. And that mitigated it for me. It was not perfect, no policy is, but it was so much better than what we had before. It was a very livable situation. The parents found it to be fair because they knew there were designated periods in the day they could contact their child without getting their child into trouble. Otherwise, it's like, just go sneak into the bathroom and call me yes. your, your dentist appointment might change. And we felt like we wanted to facilitate what I thought were reasonable um, requests from parents on those types of things. Can a child abuse that? Certainly, uh, and we addressed those when they when they came up. But overall, that approach to it made everyone as it, it was, again. It was a consensus, not unanimity, but it put us in a much better place and allowed us to live with the device. Now, was that was that independent at Middleburg High School? Yes, ma'am. Did that, or yeah. did we do that at Oak Leaf? Did we do it at Orange Park? Did we do it at all? Trevor of our and high I did schools? almost we were the exact same similar. thing. Yeah, we, 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 and and we arrived at that independently. Were, right. And the junior highs, it's my understanding, don't want the open opportunity for students to use their cell phones. They're a little bit more restrictive than the high schools. Yeah. And that's yeah. and to your point, yeah. when yeah. and yeah. having been in junior yeah. high classrooms. Yeah. When they are working together in a program, most of that's done on their personal devices, you know, and that's and so as I'm thinking through, if if somebody rarely would they use a phone, but in the high school, those same, I mean, if they're on that program, the teacher can see that they are engaged. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like learning online. Sure. You can tell if a student is engaged or not, mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, in one respect, yes, but. If you look at the screen right now, you see that there are a number of things that are open across the top, and you know, I mean, yeah, there will be other other programs on their phone that might be available, but now, they need to be engaged. Yeah, so you know, when you look at the survey, and, and, and it's not a surprise to anyone who's been in the schools, is that you, know, you look at the junior highs, and they're 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 a little more reticent to release that yes. you know, autonomy. Because I think that's reflective of the maturity of, of, yes. of the student at that age. The high school students are starting to drive. They're, they're encumbering more responsibilities. And they also have additional responsibilities like, am I going to work? To, am I driving the ball press? Am I picking up my younger sister? And so those, those types of, uh, of, of freedoms are part and parcel to us teaching the whole child and making them responsible with, with not only cell phones, but other things that are adult responsibilities. I think we should be looking at the discipline. So I think Mr. Roski's right. We should keep this broad, and Mr. Vickner should come up with a policy that, you know, is in that this would be in line with, or the policy that meets statute. Um, but I, that last incident that took place, I was very surprised, and we had this conversation that they didn't come before the board for discipline. And I think if, if the principal feels that it warrants something severe enough, we need to take, you know the steps and and let that be the fear of abusing you know and maybe you know we don't see very many of them does that mean it's not happening 
You know, I mean, only, I remember four years ago, Mr. Dell, you probably remember that other incident that took place that did come before the board. But, um, and we see some, well, and, and, so, bullying. and so it, it's a fine line between what's happening in school right. and what's happening outside of school that right. relates to people from the school. And that's where the cyberbullying That's the cyberbullying cyber comes up. And, and right. I believe uh, um, Chief Wagner was talking about the fact that so much of what we see, I mean, we've seen one too many videos from a bathroom recently. Mm -hmm. And I mean, fights and whatever, mm -hmm. and those sorts of things that come up before us. But so much of this happens outside of the school center. <coughs> But it relates to people from the school. Right. So where's that fine line that says, mm -hmm. okay, we're disciplining them for something that they did in the bedroom at home, on Facebook or whatever, but Snapchat we have a or whatever. That addresses that. So anytime um, something that takes place outside causes a, a disruption inside our classroom or our schools, that's cyberbullying that we then have to act on. We have a policy that talks about that. So maybe we need to be more forceful with the discipline aspect of abuse for the cell phones. And I don't mean just pulling it out, calling mom to say, did they change my doctor's appointment? But the, the stuff of the nature of what we saw a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. so, so if I just could, you know, each discipline incident is covered under the code of student conduct. But the code of student conduct is broad to allow flexibility based on the severity of the incident, which is different. The, uh, the number of times that this student has been involved in the similar instances are also considered in when you uh, actually apply disciplinary consequences. And so I, I don't believe that you can unilaterally just come up with a policy or a plan related to that because there are way, way too many specifics that go into making that decision mm -hmm. relative to the incident that occurred, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. I think it'd be very difficult for a board to do that, and I would strongly advise against yeah. it. Well, no, I mean, we would defer certainly to the principals to bring it to the board, but I, my thought is we don't need to change the policy on that, but enforce the discipline action more often. I, I think anything that deals with racism should have come to the board. Well, I, I think that's a separate issue from cell phones. I think well, it, it's the same issue because it was a cell phone that was used in that's school. Right. I understand and that. But the discipline, to me, needs to be based on the actions. So I think that the discipline for improper cell phone use is going to be different than bullying, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it just depends right. on how, right. the, how the referral is written, right? right? So if you're... And for example, I talked to a parent, actually was a substitute teacher, who had a situation with a kid um, who had headphones in um, during instructional time, and the, the substitute told the student to take the headphones out, mm -hmm. and the student refused, and the substitute felt like, well, they're allowed to have them, so my hands are tied, which that's false, because that's insubordination. So the issue is not necessarily the headphones, the issue is that you're refusing to uh, obey your teacher. Right. So um, I think that, to your point, there's definitely ways to have more stringent discipline for an, an action like what we saw mm -hmm. in that situation versus a child who repeatedly is accepting phone calls during the right. day. You know what I mean? So if, while we're talking about cell phones, the, the discipline policy that I liked was actually in Kansas City Public Schools, and it's on the first page. And it spells out um, first infraction, second infraction, third infraction. Um, and I really liked the fact that you get three strikes and then three strikes are out mm -hmm. and your cell phone is going to sit with the district until the end of the school year. But I don't know if that will jive with our state statute. So, um, I, and again, this is Kansas City, so it's a different state. But I think there has to be some sort of um, teeth behind improper use of the cell phone. And I don't know if maybe it's like we talked about that it, it then becomes an insubordinate issue that if they continue to misuse their cell phone that they'll be disciplined based on insubordination, not on the cell phone policy. But I agree with Ms. Karakis that the discipline could be carried on that situation. Mm -hmm.
I, I like the idea of a parent having to come and pick it up because when mm -hmm. it interferes with the parent's day, then there's going to be consequences for the kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But can, yeah, this is I this mean, is the <laughs> third infraction is pretty severe. I can't imagine that. Can we can actually we'd get away with it. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah, I don't know how they get away with it. But yeah. Did you have other? The only other um, thing that I wanted to just put out there for consideration, and I I fully support that principals need to be the ones that are creating these rules since they're the ones who are ultimately responsible for enforcing them. But when I think about cell phone use in the cafeteria, um, it's important to me that students learn that table time is not cell phone time. Um, I mean, that's a rule that we enforce in our own house. Um, and I, I want to make sure we're graduating kids who know how to have lunch with a potential associate or a potential client, that those um, conversational skills are important. Um, and I do see the advantage to handing a cell phone to a child. I see it all the time in restaurants. Mom and dad will hand out a device, and the table is perfectly quiet, but nobody's communicating. Um, so I just, I think there's a, a tight line to walk on that, um, so that we're still encouraging. And I think about communication. I think <laughs> about those students who don't have cell phones. And you know, if everybody at the table is on their phone, what is that child left to do but to get stare at their food quietly while everybody else is on their phone? Um, I think so. about the kid who doesn't have a network of friends and might be sitting by himself. You know, he can at least be reading something on his cell phone or playing a game or something. I see the advantage. And there's a lot of kids like that. Harm. You know. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I see it both ways. I see that too. You know, families that go out to eat and all four of them are sitting yep, on their cell phone. That's exactly. That's what I was thinking. And I, and and I totally parents are get sometimes it. the worst about it. Absolutely. Parents are worse than the kids a lot of times. You see the parents on the cell phones, and then the kids are goofing around, and they say, "Stop that!" Mm -hmm. And they go right. And I'm thinking, yeah. then talk to them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Then to to put on the my my principal hat. Too, you know, parents have an expectation, especially among high school age students, that they can communicate with, with their students. So you have to kind of designate a time yeah. for that to occur. Uh, and but believe me, there's plenty of conversation going on in a high school cafeteria yeah. when you got 2,700 of them yeah. in a building. They're all they're all talking, but it, it's an opportunity to do that. So I realize it's a it's a tough. Well, uh, and to walk. Ashley's point, all elementary school and junior high, definitely elementary school, but it sounds like junior high too, no cell phones right. throughout the day. So they do have that time in the lunchroom mm -hmm. to socialize and, mm -hmm. and talk and carry out and be kids. And so I, I think I, I wouldn't be comfortable adding that to the, mm -hmm. the secondary high school level mm -hmm. just because of no, that's, I agree yeah. with what it's just and, and the, you said. Yeah. It, I hear again, I think Ms. Pickett said this, that, you know, when you get into, a, and this is true in elementary and it's true in junior <coughs> high, kids eat their lunch. They stand in line, they get their lunch, they sit down, they eat what they, I mean, they're given a nice lunch. Mm -hmm. They look at this and they choose what they want to eat and leave the rest, perhaps. Um, but then they're done. And they eat within 10 minutes. They don't, mm -hmm. they, and then they're, Available, and that's I mean that's when the talking I mean even now so many of the elementary schools when you go into a cafeteria for lunch oh they're loud uh, they're still loud <laughs> yeah. and they're half as full I mean yeah. or they're all sitting on one side of a table so they're not facing somebody for lunch and right. I mean they are still talking they are still I mean you know it's like whoa, whoa, you know that it's and that depending on the group and depending on the age it sometimes gets louder or softer depending mm -hmm. but um. Yeah, I, 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 as much as I would love to see that, because we were the same. You, I mean, you just don't bring your phone to the table. Period. That's leave it in the other room. And, and uh, well, I, I, I visited a uh, St. Augustine Deaf school one time, and mm -hmm. they were so busy signing, and finally the they weren't eating. <laughs> yeah, that's it. The, the person at the front signed, "Stop talking and eat." <laughs> <laughs> So if I could, if I could yeah. kind of bring some um, closure. closure to mm -hmm. this. So, so here's what I heard, and correct me if I didn't hear this correctly. Uh, we, we need to take a look at the language, the suggested add of privilege 
due to the statute piece of that, right. I kind of feel like we should take a, a close look at the wording to make sure it's in, <laughs> in line. Uh, we like the uh, the other language. Seemed to be I, I didn't sense any objection to the other language that was there. Uh, what I did hear was uh, you know some concern over uh, having a specific plan or consequences you know for it. But then I also heard that um, you know each situation is different and difficulty in doing that and confiscating of phones might not be appropriate. You know, given Florida statute, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel good in the sense that <coughs> the suggested language here for the Code of Student Conduct Committee to look at, it seems to be appropriate. The board seems to be in favor of, of those additions based on just what I've heard here. Mm -hmm. I think the board is going to take a look at, at board policy and make some policy decisions that would be in line with what we're suggesting because now we're starting that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else as far as direction that the board would like to give? I, I just don't want, want to ever see a time where we, where an administrator or, or a school person couldn't take a phone away if they needed to. If I thought, it's like a pencil. I mean, that's a right and a privilege too, but if a kid's stabbing it, no, right. still, I'm taking it away. And the same yes. thing with a phone, yeah. cell phone. Yep. They're using it for inappropriate. Appropriate. Yeah. Like calling in a 911 call or doing something that... Then I, I could take that phone without, and I mean, it sounds like you know. Could, right? Like, yeah. Mr. Bickner, didn't you say that we can regulate, so if they're using it inappropriately, yeah. the teacher has the authority that, to take it away? They could be taken away if they needed to. I, I think you can take it away, but I don't know how far that goes. Can you take it away for the day? Eh, maybe, but... Can you take it away for the year? I don't think so. Right. No. Well, that's um, I think the, the fallback big exactly. statute yeah. is you can discipline, you can make rules, but they may bring a cell phone to school and to yeah. uh, activities that are associated with school. So, and that's kind of the long and the short of it. Again, the problem is, just like Mr. Brosky saying, if you make things too stringent or too yeah. focused, right. this is very focused. This statute's focused. And they don't give you any real details about how to do that. That gets hashed out every time somebody sues somebody, and it gets a little bit less yeah. or more obfuscated. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in, in line with Ms. Bullock's concerns, I think you can do what you have to do to run your school. But I think that the language is clear that it needs to be somehow included in whatever code of conduct we have. The other thing that I have as a thought is, if you write a code of conduct that meets statutory requirements and meets the needs of the school, it's easier for me to work backward to a, to a board policy than it is to take a board policy and then try and draft a code of conduct. The code of conduct is, is what everybody needs to work from. The board policy is more focused, but I can, I can tailor a board policy to a code of conduct and still meet the statutory requirements and make it mesh together and make sense. So, so if I'm we saying do one first and I'll do the other second. If we were to take the recommended additions to what we currently have, does that work with what you're thinking? I don't have I, I have I have no problem with that whatsoever as long as you add some language to make it comply with one zero zero six zero seven. The other thing that I would do is ultimately I'm going to have to change that uh, 4.05 because um, that's no longer the primary concern. Mm -hmm. The primary concern now is the use of cell phones for all of the other things that are distracting in a school right. situation. Right. Drug dealers have whole different ways of doing stuff now, I think. I'm not sure what they are. Mm -hmm. I do have one other question. Mm -hmm. Do you guys want to address um, cell phone use on school buses? On school buses? Mm -hmm. Is that something we want to address? In There's a, yeah, that is... The current policy, going back to, I think there was a policy in the or code of conduct, in the code of yeah, conduct yeah. and it was student conduct on the school bus. No, that's... Was there anything in this code of conduct you didn't do? No, 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 this is fine. I just was asking if no, you for the school bus code of conduct. Yeah, wouldn't it be the... If, if you look right below. I don't know if I have that. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I kind of thought this covered things <laughs> well. I 
again, that might be something that's different for elementary than it is for secondary. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we probably should address it. And maybe it's something that it's at the discretion of the school bus driver. I mean, it's, but, you know, I, I think it should be something that we talk about. I would assume that the same thing holds true, that if, yeah. I mean, these, this is a bring your own device on any school property. Mm -hmm. And a school bus is considered school, school property. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I would assume that a school bus driver would probably, here again, elementary school, or the elementary students may be able to power up their phones so that the parents know that they're on their way home. Absolutely. I mean, you're talking so, about the GPS system, right. the junior high similarly in the high school. And my other thought on that is that if it happens in the cafeteria that we allow them to use their cell phones and the noise level goes down, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be wonderful on a school bus? Mm -hmm. That the, the, the noise level would go down. So could but we just, just incorporate the word school bus into the, you know, when you talk about the policy on school grounds, classroom, cafeteria, school bus, and just add school bus into that cell phone use code of conduct section and also cell phone use for the school so the policy, then the same would apply for at, in the physical building as it would Well, and it does, bus. like that. Per, the first line, taking photographs or videos by any means whatsoever while on school property or while on school transportation oh, so is not. prohibited. So it says it there. Okay. And then the only exceptions of this prohibition are, and then that goes on. And then the publication of any internet site of any photographs, videos, or images taken in violation. But that's mm -hmm. not, yeah, it's still that fine line that what we were talking about before. Um, but then it goes specifically into the schools. So. But as long as it has the school transportation. It does have school transportation, which is considered that. school property, which. Right encompasses all of the rules, I would assume. And here again, a bus driver... It's impossible to enforce when you get your back to the kids. Oh, gosh, yeah. So. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and truly, kids that, ha I mean, and I haven't been in the classroom for five years, and I know that they're probably even more savvy now, but they power up, I'm certain, as soon as they walk out the door of the classroom. Oh, yeah. Or even when they're still sitting there packing up. Mm -hmm. Because... If particularly if they're walking or riding their bikes, their parents are like, mm, you will and put this on so I can follow you home. Yeah. When I watch the school bus videos, because whenever oh. I have a bus accident or an incident on the bus, mm -hmm. I get to see those videos along with Chris Isaiah. So when I'm watching the school bus video and I'm watching the school bus driver, and she's looking out here, and she's also got to monitor what's going on behind her and what's going on all around her, it would really concern me if she's sitting there worrying about what you're doing with your cell phone. Exactly. I mean, exactly. right now, they crash buses and, and things happen on buses that uh, they need to have their eyes on what they have their eyes on. That's right. Like, most of the time, you're lucky if you can get them to sit down. Mm -hmm. so, I think I, verbally they try to enforce it because, I mean, the rules are up there on them. Right. But, you know, you just have to... And at the beginning of the year, everybody goes through all of the rules and, yeah, exactly. There, there was one, oh, I'm sorry, is there anything else? No, no, that, that's it. Yeah. I loved in Oregon the fact that a teacher could have a sign that said, no electronic devices permitted at this time. Yeah, I agree. And if there was something uniform, and I don't know, if, I mean, you know, it's something that a teacher can slap up and just say, this is, and we're in the middle of a test. Yeah. And don't give me that, I, you told me I could use my phone when I was done. You know, no, the sign's up, you're not, it's not on, period. And that gives us one more sort of opportunity to say, uh-uh, we can see a picture right here, the sign was up, whatever. Um, and there was one other comment about, I, I know that each school has their own, in essence, these are our, our this is our operating procedure. And I don't know if we need to relate to that at all in our code of student conduct. You know what I'm saying? Do we need to refer to additional information at the secondary level? Um, a line that says, and further clarification during the orientation at school. I, you know, something like that. 
just so it's one of those loopholes that I keep thinking, well, it wasn't in the Code of Student Conduct. It's, it's given here. It's given at the school. I don't know if we need that. I see that as no different than the, the restart plan. The last paragraph that put, I put in that restart plan said that Mr. Brust had the ability to manipulate that within the parameters of the restart plan to meet the needs as they came about. And I think you can do that with school principals as well. You can put something in code of conduct and also in board policy that, that says, and I'd have to think the language through, that the administrator of the school site has the ability to, or the, may, manipulate or, or, or add to or refine those policies in order to meet the specific individual needs of the school site. They because can. that's, like I said, I think they are all different. I yes, think oh, absolutely. School is a lot different than Keystone. That's, and that's why I was like, well, we don't want to put individual, right. and, but and something. You don't want to lock people up. You don't wrong. want to keep their yeah. hands tied because, again, whenever there's a, a crack in the, the armor, mm -hmm. somebody's going to find it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so then we got to try and manipulate things around to make things fit. So I, I agree with you. I think, but I think the principals can do that, but we need to put the language in there to allow it to do that. To allow it, There's yes. an example of that in the Charlotte policy. Mm -hmm. um, in the last third of the first paragraph, it says, the principal may put additional rules in place permitting student use of cell phones during non-instructional times of the school day. Right. I like that. Yeah. yeah. The pr the principal must assure that these rules are publicized. Publicized to students and parents. So there you go. Yeah. Okay, so we need to give direction. Do we? Um, I, do are we, we all comfortable with the original code of conduct, and then add Mr. Brodsky's new stuff, and have Mr. Bickner? incorporate statute and what you and Ashley were just talking about? Well, this, in <coughs> essence, replaces the bring your own device on the original student code of conduct. So it's not necessarily, I mean, it replaces that section. Well, and you wanted to add, you said. I don't think it really oh, be any of oh, oh, that. Yeah. It doesn't bring your own device in the current one. Right. So that, you'll that's incorporate a, yeah. and bring us something new. Correct. Correct. Okay. It'll be so just so you know, just for clarification, the, the, the whole code of student conduct, there's a whole committee of folks mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. involved in that. The thought process was we want to make sure we incorporated the board's thoughts before we got, got the it. whole committee right. so, of people yeah. together. So that, this covers yep, those I think, thoughts. I think we're good. Right. Okay. And, and we need and a statute then, in there. So yep. we'll have Mr. Bickner review to make sure we're on legal ground. And he's yeah. already working yeah. on that. Mr. Bickner, right? And at the same time... You're working on the... the, the hey, and you're working on the change in, sta in our policy? Incorporating a yeah. statute. Okay. Yeah. okay. But I, yeah. until, I get a, until I get a code of conduct to look at... Correct. There's right. There's not much way that I can change that. Okay. I know that we're working right. on that. Ms. Palmer's working on other things having to do with discipline that she and I are talking back and forth. Yes. So. Got it. Okay. And your third thing, I'm sorry. I don't remember what it was. Sorry. <laughs> okay. off, but I, you were saying it, and I thought, wait, I thought we had talked about that, yeah. and I thought he had talked about that. And okay. <laughs> as long as we are all the same and at the same time, you were saying, yeah. and we're addressing the policy issue, those are the two things. Okay. There was just, I, I just had a comment about the upcoming disciplinary hearings. You had said that we may be meeting as early as 2.45. It, it appears that way. I mean, Stephanie Palmer will still And that can change, time. but yeah. there were three that were that were reviews or um, two appeals, two, yeah. two appeals, two appeals. So it'll be an interesting day, a very full day at the next meeting. So anything else? That's it. I'm, I'm good. Mr. Bickner, any other comments? I'm good. Thank you. Ms. Bullock. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the operations department. The um, laundry facility at the Keystone Heights High School is coming along. I was there the other day. Uh, we'll have somebody donate some tables, folding tables for their laundry, and I saw them scraping the paint and ready to paint, so I appreciate that. I did understand there were two broken war lines at Houston Elementary School over spring break. Do you yes, know ma'am, there were. And that's been repaired, I assume? Yes, ma'am. Both been repaired. Okay, thank you. And that was over spring break, correct? That was during spring break. Thank you. Two what lines? Two war lines. A oh, water line. Mm -hmm. Got it. Hmm. Thankfully, it happened during spring break. Yes. Yeah. 
Oh, Mr. Richter? There is one thing that I need to bring up. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> I've been asked about the uh, application process for the Oversight yes. Committee. If you go to the, to the website, mm -hmm. go to Ed First, click on Ed First, takes you right to it. And then you click on the application or you can click on the... It was all done and I think uh, Sabrina Thomas it went hot yesterday. Okay, and thank I think you. She's working with Ms. Dennis to make sure that everything is funneled to the right. Yeah, great. So yeah. now, that if we know of people who are interested in applying to be on that committee, it's, it's there. we can tell them go here yeah. and click on Ed first, and yeah. everything will come up. They can fit it out right. online. It's all. It's an interactive system, or they can print it out and do a paper application. I've had a can we see who's asked, applied so yet? No, it just went hot I yesterday. No he said that. So. Talk yeah, to so, Dennis. and I talked to Ethan yesterday about it because the applications go to COC application at oneplay.net and I was trying to log in and I caught myself kicked out so he's just setting my password okay. <laughs> because the idea is as soon as they come in, um, and I was having him add Bryce to it as well, so as soon as they come in, we can look at it real quick and then forward it to you guys for the each person so that you're not getting, which we were going to say, like the application deadline for it. Um, did we discuss a deadline of when we're So I was we looking not. at potentially April 23rd as a deadline to put it on the May 6th board agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's if one month. If we're going to do that, wait. we need to put a deadline on the website. Correct. So there's not a deadline of like how long we're keeping this open to accept applications, but then in talking with Bryce yesterday, we want to ensure that you guys have enough time that if you want to discuss to at the next workshop, which is March or April, sorry, April, April the end of April, 20, April 27th. Um, so even if you had it as the deadline on the 23rd, if we're filtering, if like Bryce, Sabrina, and I are filtering it to you guys, it wouldn't be like giving you a stack to look at last minute. It would be something that you've kind of been able to review as it goes. Um, that, you know, there could be a discussion then if you guys want it on the, the workshop and then with a proposal of the committee approved at the May 6th, the board meeting, if you would want to look at it like that was the timeline. But right now, we give them about a full month for you guys to work with people. And then also talking with Bryce, is that something where you guys would want us to put out like a social media blast on yes. our social media that's like, hey, website link yeah. for this, yes. go to the Ed first if you're interested and we can kind of make sure um, Sabrina's kind of managing that while Nicole's out, just get a couple posts up where we have it so people can click right from our Facebook and Instagram or share with somebody else like, oh hey, the application's live. Facebook and Instagram would be great and then we can share as well. Correct. So that's, yeah, yeah. I mean as people, yeah, send it out. So get it out as much as yeah. possible. So and that would be great. Literally be right great. on, like when you go to oneclay.net, it's under the Ed First tab. Okay. So there's the tab that says Ed First, and then there's the drop downs on the side. It's the first one after home that says Citizen Oversight Committee. But we don't have an end date on it. So that was something um, I know we discussed yesterday as well, bringing up like an end date of when we would stop applications for you guys. And that would, yes, great. Does anyone have any concerns about making it at the end of April at this stage? If we don't have enough applications at that point, we can always extend it. Yeah, and then I if mean, we see them coming in, it will come. And I think I did that before with the district advisory committee. I would say like, hey, I'm going to be able to send you three, or I'm going to send you this many, or you know, you don't have any in your area right now. So we'll kind of be able to monitor it. I just week. I just brought it up. It's very easy. Next, next, next. Oh, nice, nice. Looks very good. good. It does. It looks very good. Thank you. And thanks Thank you. for letting us know that this is hot now because this Ms. is. Ms. Thomas was the one that actually put it together. I told her, I handed her everything and told her that it's all her problem. Great. <laughs> so if we have any complaints, we complain to Sabrina and not you. Got it, got it. And Bruce, if you need any cell phone help, talk to Sabrina. Yeah. <laughs> say, just show me how to turn it off. <laughs> Black Creek is open, I think. <laughs> 218, there's lots of construction. You'll go slow. You just, <coughs> there you go. Sorry. Uh, Ms. Caracas. Nothing. Ms. Clark? I need to just follow up on a couple of things um, because citizens are asking. Mm -hmm. I think a while back I had asked about uh, the students that live around Orange Park Elementary. There can't be that many of them, but instead of them taking a bus to another school, uh, 
what's the possibility of them being allowed to go to that concept school? Obviously, they have to follow the rules that all other students do, but instead of having to go through the lotto process, I mean, they're not win. Do they get a little bit of yeah, yeah. benefit because they are a neighborhood? Because they, it's a walk to school for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's really not a neighborhood school. That's a concept <coughs> school for the entire mm -hmm. county. Right. So we would be have to. Also, the space available. Right. <coughs> right. So it, it would have to. But as you get up to the second and third grade, it, it's a little bit easier mm -hmm. to get in. Okay. Kindergarten, first grade, very tough to get in. Mm -hmm. Just something you're asking for. <clears throat> and going back to uh, Dave Coughlin's uh, introduction at our last board meeting and on the email that we all received, I think the questions at hand, we need to find out when that video was implemented to our subs for training. <clears throat> and we want to find, find out who approved it or whether it's just in a contract with Kelly that they're allowed to add and subtract as we go along, so that we know, you know, and and personally, I know it's not a horrendous. Uh, there's nothing that really stands out, but I don't see the need to put it back in for the training. I think an hour and 20 minute video on top of everything else that they're having to deal with for emergency situations is enough training for us. But that's a personal. Now, it, and question, Kelly Services is a national. Mm -hmm. yes. So depending on when they did this video, I mean, that's it's probably something that's corporate. And we just happen to get sure. what they do nationally. I, and I don't. But it I depends don't. on what our contract says. Correct. Or that's Correct. Or whether we have to. So we can, we can certainly look into when that was implemented. I, I, my email returned back is that. You know, uh, this particular vendor is one of 1,400 vendors that the district does does business with, and, and they all have employees that are trained uh, within that business. I invited any individual who'd like to, and the board themselves, to go through the training themselves if there's any issue related to um, this particular one. I think sometimes uh, people will look at things and they'll have an interpretation of that. Uh, and perhaps have an interpretation out of context. And so it would be important to come in and actually do due diligence and see mm -hmm. that. I mean, uh, anybody can speak to a topic, but I think when you speak to a topic, you should do the research to see what exactly in context, in the total context, the information is given. And so that's very clear to, and I'll make it clear to the board also, if you have any objection or concern, please come in. And, and view it for yourself real, related to it. I've been assured that there is no concern. And our contract, you said, is up in 23. So we've got two more years. 23, yeah. 23 years. And that was, and that, it's a long contract, five years. We have a lot of, not a lot, but we have five year contracts are not unheard of. Right. Yeah. And it's, and we did do, we just, well, 5, 2018. So yeah, it was two years ago, and there were other corporate, other organizations that we looked at. Yep. Um, and at the time, we really wanted to bring our substitute teachers back in house. Mm -hmm. That was kind of our goal. But when we looked at the financial, mm -hmm. it just was not feasible. It's, a, it's when the there was a study that was done in 2018. It's actually uh, according to that study, an 8.6 percent decrease in cost from if we assumed it ourselves. Mm -hmm. A decrease in cost? If yes, it's actually it. it's actually cheaper because don't forget you have the Affordable Care Act. You know, if we went to Kelly, to, to you're, you're Kelly. saying it back. Right. Oh, no, did I say yeah, it backwards? Yeah. To go with yeah. Kelly, yeah. Kelly yeah. 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 I hope that Mr. Brass, you don't get yeah. 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 No, we went with more expensive. We did not. Yeah. 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 Well, I think overall, some things we, we can't always look at the budget bottom line. I mean, we don't do it with transportation or we wouldn't have bus drivers or buses. True. That's, you know, and we. Uh, but we wouldn't have the service either. Exactly. Uh, I can tell you those that contract out, those districts, cannot, they have right. a terrible time. Yep. And so, I mean, we can't always look at it. I agree with you on that. And we're yeah. in a different financial situation exactly. now than we were yeah. in 2018. So. So, I mean, I, it's unbelievable how many people come up to me and who had been 
sub teachers and said, I find it so impersonal now. I don't even want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I haven't had one person come to me and say, we're so happy to have Kelly over us doing it ourselves. I haven't had that. It's oh. been totally the opposite. Mm -hmm. So I, I would talk to some of the principal secretaries. I, I, I'll be honest, I was asked to become an assistant principal mm -hmm. a number of years ago because of my background and I, you know, and I thought, no, and one of the key things <coughs> that kept me from being an assistant principal was calling for subs. There was no way that I was going, I, that's not why I was in education, and I would not, I mean, I'm saying you're going, no, 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 I mean, it was, the 5 a.m. phone calls and the, oh my child's vomiting now and oh my, how am I going to find the sub and yeah. and yes, every school every school has their crew their their Absolutely. typical subs. Their list of As a teacher, I had my favorite subs. There was in fact I was at a concert at Oak Leaf recently and I ran into one of my old subs and I said, Are you still subbing? She was awesome. And she said no, because of COVID, she obviously wasn't getting any work at that time. But then, um, but that's, I mean, that broke my heart. Sure. Because she was awesome. And she, I mean, I would have you know, know, months in advance to get her. You so can look it's, for, it's tough. You can look for ways to create that kind of atmosphere. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was with Kelly. I mean, yeah. that, so. Yeah. But when I look at the twelve dollar an hour pay, oh, yeah. you know that's, that's something else. Well, that will change it. Yeah. And we yeah. had at one time, um, and I think we probably changed it maybe four years ago. The salary for our subs. Um, oh, for our degree. We we went in line with what St. John's was paying and Duval because we had. I think the average was 100, and with the master's degree, 125 a day, we lowered it to be in line with the, all the other counties because, again, you know, the funding, the funding's mm -hmm. not there. Mm -hmm. so we'll say in two years. Give it time. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Kilhausen, where am I? Here. <laughs> nothing for me. Okay. And I have nothing more to to say, so thank you all for being here today. This meeting's a good